I've been listening all morning to different speakers, and, and it's kind of funny. I was, I was smiling to myself. I think kind of when, when I go through mine now, you, you're probably going to sit there thinking, Jesus, to put all these people in the one room on the one day and give them, you know, indoctrinated them all, because there's a lot of common terms coming up all the time and words that, that are, you know, repeating all the time. And it's a bit cliched, but the reason it's cliched is because it's right. It makes sense. Um, and I don't know if you were down here for Keith earlier on. He was on second this morning, I think. One of the, the big takeaways I had, and it's not new by any means, but it's something that it was brought back up for me again. It's about, you know, what, what we're all about together is how we make people feel. And that's important to kind of keep in mind. We'll revisit that hopefully before we finish up. But in terms of myself and in terms of what I want to speak about here, um, Probably over the last number of years, you'll have seen at club level, and particularly at county level especially, sports science making its present felt. And as Martin says there, for a long, long time, I've been working in coaching, in the GA, managing coaching teams, that type of thing. And, and probably as a disclaimer at this stage, I operate in the area of sports science. So I work in it and I work with it, um, not just in GA, but, but across other sports. Now today, I don't want to talk up for sports science and I don't want to talk it down either. Because change and innovation are going to happen regardless, almost in the same, in the same fashion. If you look at it kind of almost like as a, as a third coming, in the same fashion that performance analysis came along and strength and conditioning came along and grew legs and proliferated at county level and then caught fire at club level. Today really for me is about learning from the, the adoption of sports, or sorry, strength and conditioning and performance analysis and positioning one concept, balance. So, the success or relative failure of sports science completely rests with balance. You've got to get the right balance and keep the balance right. Now, in layman's terms, what does that mean? It means the dog wags the tail as opposed to the other way around. You see, sports science has got to fit you rather than you fitting it. And almost every footballer or hurler that you know that have gone through a common journey, a very, very long journey, and it would have displayed the very best that they had in terms of strength, in terms of endurance, in terms of resolve, will, learning, achievement. You know, our hero there, the little lad. You know, what are we seeing there? Well, like there's many, there's any number of things, but primarily you're seeing competence. You're seeing self-actualization. You're seeing autonomy. And you're seeing self-attribution, amongst many, many other things. But the question I want you to just ask yourself is, would you take any of those things away from that young lad? You know, and the instant answer is no, you wouldn't. And the reason being, great learning and progress comes from within. But it's hard and it's difficult. It's a skill that's got to be nurtured in an environment rooted in values. Because, and you would have heard this earlier on today, values drive behaviours, behaviours drive cultures. And external aids and tools have got a place in this. There's no doubt about it. But you've got to see them more like a helpful hand. Okay, like they're like a tool in the toolbox or a facilitator. They've got to be a means rather than an end. So those of an age in the room, not being ageist, do forgive me. We remember the space race, and for the younger ones in the room, space race was effectively a competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. So effectively, it created a fight for supremacy, bragging rights, all that type of thing, and the look of the leader with regard to space travel. In the midst of all this, a rather challenging issue cropped up for the US astronauts. Uh, they found that in a zero gravity environment, their pens wouldn't work. So they couldn't write upside down, they couldn't really write at all, and they were going, Jesus Christ, what are we going to do here? So whilst all the other great work's going on, they spent about two years and north of $20 million developing a pen that would work in space, and they clapped themselves in the back. And meanwhile, the Russians used a pencil. 
Now, it's a, it's a neat enough story, okay? There's probably a bit of urban legend attached to it, but it's a huge, huge reflection on how we can forget common sense and simplicity at our peril. Just another little story, or an example, I guess. Any of you have ever done the Marshmallow Challenge? No, good. Well, the Marshmallow Challenge is simple enough. I'll put you in a group of three or four or five people, a team, you're gonna to work together for 18 minutes. And you've gotta build the tallest freestanding structure that you can build with 20 sticks of spaghetti, a yard or a meter of sticky tape, a meter of string, and one marshmallow. And normally what happens is this. And that tends to happen with groups such as MBAs, lawyers, CEOs. They have a pretty rough time for the 18 minutes. It's all great crack at the start, but then pretty quickly it, it falls asunder. And they really don't get the job done. They end in failure or they, or they run out of time. But there are some groups that get it done and get it done really, really well. And who are they? Well, the kids from junior school, and kind of better again, the kindergarten kids. And the secret of their success is pretty simple. They keep the end in mind. They keep it simple, but they keep the end in mind. They're iterating based on a desired outcome. That's, that's effectively it in a nutshell. But they've got an approach that's integrated and it's inclusive. They're working together. And working together, they just leverage what they have and they use the most important KPI of all, keeping people involved. They work as a team. You see videos of this, by the way, it's scientific research. You see videos of, of the MBAs and the CEOs, and it's all Johnny Big Balls after five minutes. Everyone's got the answer, and no one has the answer. And the MBAs and, and these other groups, I'm not giving out about them, by the way, forgive me any MBAs in the room, but they, they tend, they end with the marshmallow, where the kids start with the marshmallow. It's a slightly different level of thinking. And it's a bit like in our world, it's like thinking, you know, we have everything in place, now let's build a performance culture. Instead, of keeping the end result in our, in our mind, front of mind, building on strong foundations, and then continuously iterating. So, you know, if you could summarize those few pieces there, how is a video of a kid learning how to walk, a pencil in space, and a gang of kids building a marshmallow tower, how is it linked in any way to GA or sports science? Well, that's pretty simple, really. They're the really, really, really strong examples of what works well in our GA world in terms of what we accept as being the mindsets, the approaches, and the values that are going to underpin us towards maintaining balance. And balance when we're introducing tools to help to, to cater for improvement for our players and coaches. See, we have a very unique backdrop in the GEA. As you sit here today, you're sitting at a coaching conference that's the longest running one in the world. Now, how does that kind of thing happen? It happens because of uniqueness. And our uniqueness brings about its own nuances and contexts. And for my money anyway, and listen to the people earlier on, the 21st century GEA is going to thrive on balance, both of the old and the trustworthy and the new. See, balance is, and it should be about and is about, it's about having full minds and full people. It's not singularly focused on filling up a trophy cabinet. Now, there's nothing wrong with winning, and there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of trophies. But if it's just that, it's zero sum, or it's binary. Win, you're a great lad, lose, you're not. Now, who, who wants that? Our world, it's about legacy, and it's about creating a better tomorrow. Within that, there's a huge need for tools to help us do that, but they've got to be a really, really good fit. Now, I know it's easy, and from experience in and with sports science stuff, it's easy to get hypnotized by the technology, and the sports science tools, and all the impressive words, all the impressive graphics, the reports, the information, the research, the studies, the interviews on TV, you can get bamboozled and just get sucked right into it. But, you know, we gotta get over the fear of missing out. You know, and, and that sense that if we don't engage in this right now, we're gonna be left behind. We've always gotta keep balance. And what's balance all about? Well, it's about having full minds, it's about having full people, and it's about legacy. Recently enough, I was chatting to a guy about, about on this topic. It was, I think it was November. I was kind of starting to get this all, pull all this together. This is draft number 19, by the way. Um, and, you know, his, his opinion was, and I tried to get everyone's opinion, people in the middle, people who love sports science, people who hate it, whatever. 
And his opinion was pretty clear, you know, it's the greatest con in the GAA. I was like, okay, that's fair enough. But it triggered something in me. And I kind of said to myself, okay, it's the greatest con in the GAA. Try and understand his opinion. But with that, kind of a little light went on. It's not the greatest con in the GAA. The greatest con in the GAA is that. It's connection. Sorry for the wordplay. And sports science and digital tools, they can really become a crutch. And in the GAA context, we need coaches and managers you know, who, who may engage sports science, but they do it on their terms. And they do it through the lens of connection. So that's connection to people, connection to values and behaviors, and connection to legacy. But then the follow-on is like, what's a good filter then for discerning what tools can and will help us with these connections? You've probably seen it in other talks. It's a model that's, that's well used at this stage, but very, very simple, very, very easy to understand. You start with why. And it gives you a strong start point towards any decision, sports related, life related, business related. And starting with why is simple enough in that it allows us a decision based on who we are, what we're about, our values, our authenticity, and with the end in mind, and the optimum out outcome that we want. You see, if your why is clear enough, then the how and the what become apparent very, very quickly. So once your why is in place and it's well informed, you're gonna see the how mechanics, the, the whole thing, all that, how are you gonna bring it to life? And that, that comes about very, very clearly. And also how we're gonna drive connection with the, the people that can best assist us and help us in this. And the one big thing, one of the big takeaways I think today, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you out of this, the biggest impact we can coach, have as coaches and managers is that there, with regard to introducing any type of sports science, if you choose to, is that. Join Generation Y before you do anything. Before you do anything. Why? Because let's develop future generations and players just rooted in what we know to be our authentic values and behaviors, whilst we're just simply guided and facilitated by new tools and new approaches but with the primary focus bringing our why to life. And in our context, the primary why has always to be seen through three lens. Participation, performance, and personal development and wellness. Now, I'm kind of talking to the educated here. You guys know that language and communication skills, they're, as coaches and managers, they're our most vital skills. But be under no illusion, sports science must communicate with the wider player and coach community to gain acceptance, to avoid ambiguities, to avoid misinterpretation, and avoid misinformation. And to show us its usefulness through the prism of participation, performance, personal wellness and development, which is the learning environment. So for any new tool or discipline to be a great fit, it's got to act and behave in congruence with the outcomes of the learning environment. It's got to earn its right. Otherwise, trust me, it's just a shiny new thing. You know, and all, all these words and terms, and you hear them here today, and you're going to hear them upstairs, and they all feel right, they sound right, they look right. But unless they're brought to life, they're only words. And like, what are all the behaviors that are going to bring this to life? Well, bringing it all to life, it's living in the here and now, and is, quite simply, fully buying into a player-centered, coach, manager, driven approach. There's widely available evidence that, although it's challenging to achieve, it bears fruit. Not only for now, but into the future. And today, this week, this month, we're all right in the GEA future. The players you have today are the coaches and managers of tomorrow. We're setting the legacy that they'll carry forward. They'll coach, manage, and they'll lead in the same fashion that they experienced. So, you know, what, what do we want to leave behind? When we're done coaching and managing, what, what do we want to leave behind for them to bring forward? You know, what, what do you want the coaches and managers of 20 years' time to behave like? And the biggest, one of the other big things I can share with you in regard to taking sports science and making sure it works for you and for our people, simple enough. Just ask better questions. The people I see in Ireland and abroad that make it work the best that those that see it's not all about the answers, but it's the ability to ask ever better questions. And it's about being driven by why. It's a bit like peeling an onion. You just keep peeling layer by layer by layer by layer. But too often in this world that we live in, we're too caught up with answers, and we want whatever can give us a quick answer. And what I've seen time and time again, is not, not just in GEA, but across many, many sports, 
is that the right answer to the wrong question is still the wrong answer. So the right answer to the wrong question is still the wrong answer. And we all know the big issues we're facing today from ESI reports and anecdotal evidence. But like, what are the right questions? Who's getting the right answers? And more to the point, why are they getting the right answers? Well, in general, it's two groups at the op at opposite ends of the spectrum. You're the best of the best, and then you have our friends here, friend, our kids and senior infants. And why? Well, the kids in the Marshmallow Challenge, for example, and the guys in the Russian space that, that went with the pencil, they taught and behaved strategically as opposed to tactically. And what does that mean? So if all we're doing is living in the here and now with no global picture, then sports science and its introduction becomes a tactical decision as opposed to a strategic one. The tail's wagging the dog, and you can very, very quickly fall victim to this. Now, if we were to examine a strategic position over a tactical one, it might sound something like, what's the best tool to assist us with the insights so that we develop players robust to performance demands, but without impeding on their health and wellness? Now, the better we answer this type of succinct question, the better follow-on questions we ask in terms of what we need to do. What can sports science do for us? And you know, we're getting plenty of answers, guys. Like, there's so many, in fact, that it's a bit in danger of becoming like wallpaper. We see it again and again and again and again, we cease to notice. And we hear the same issues at a frequency, you know, again, it's just, it's just more words. But we under no illusion, what happens at county level rolls down to club level. So, you know, to use the old phrase, if county level sneezes, then the club catches a flu. And you've got to ask, if county level have introduced sports science and they're all using it and it's all cool, you know, how well are we using it when, you know, a few things are shouting out to us. 63% of players are not getting adequate sleep and rest. One in six get eight to ten hours sleep on a training day. Now, you don't need to be a sports scientist to know that recovery is a massive cornerstone, yet, as we all go for further, higher, stronger, faster, we're completely forgetting that if you train hard, you've got to rest harder. Poor sleep and recovery moves to poor adaptation, moves to lower readiness, and then you're into burnout scenarios. 40% of players had no time off in a 12-month period. 46% of players say that too much effort's demanded of them. Shockingly, only 25% of players felt that, said that they felt fresh and rested during the 2017 championship season. Now, that's despite the fact that sports science can objectively measure collective and individual training load and readiness to train status. So if we're not measuring and monitoring all these vital matters, what are we doing? You know, if, if what we're doing with sports science is not helping people and players and teams improve consistent with GEA principles, then we've probably got to revisit and rethink. And a, a large root of the problem stems from this. There's a chap called Frederick Taylor. Um, he's one of the godfathers of scientific management. And that's his, his, his opus there, Principles of Scientific Management. And I don't want to kind of get into paraphrasing, but in the interest of time, I'll narrow it down to two lines. If you use a clipboard and a stopwatch, you can manage the performance and outputs of your workforce. That was basically it. That's, that's what his book amounted to. You know, what's changed? We're still measuring and managing. We're still commanding and controlling. We've got more data, more monitoring, more information that we know how to handle. And sports science tools are developing and iterating at a rate that's faster than most people's ability to use them optimally in the right context. We're generating lots of data, lots of answers, but the ability to ask great questions, and those great questions grounded in the values that we know will de deliver a great future, is badly compromised. And when I see sports science behaving badly, I see that we're creating information, not insights. Information keeps us busy, it's a cool distraction. It gives the illusion of wisdom, but it also supports the notion that we see our people as players and not as people, that they're valuable and not valued. And that mindset there, the issue with that, the issue with that approach is that it's a glass half empty mindset. It leads to people and programming, people and programming that's, you see, systemizing, 
And what's that? Well, it's, it's quite simply, it's been welded and married to an approach that because the data says so, because the publication says so, we're going to do this. It's reductionist. You know, and if we're not careful, we reduce everything that we do down to numbers alone, binary thinking. So what does that mean? Well, you see, you see it everywhere. You know, Johnny ran 10,000 metres, Paddy ran 9,000 metres, and therefore Johnny's session was more effective than Paddy's. Now, you kind of go, he's talking nonsense. It is nonsense, by the way. But that's happening. It becomes big brotherish. Players have a sense that they've been watched over all the time. They're not even seeing the reports of this stuff. But the whole idea of sports science, guys, was not, it was about monitoring athletes, players, but it was to turn the mirror back on us to see is what we're prescribing appropriate and responsible. It's not about just measuring them and being big brother and those guys and girls. And then the big stick approach. You're off the panel because your figures aren't good enough. I mean, think about it. Why would anybody stick at it? You know, what, what we're talking about there is their industrial age, assembly line, cog on the wheel, command and control behaviours. Now, they're the type of behaviours consistent with what outcomes you want. Like in Taylor's time, that's a race to the bottom. Now, the problem with a race to the bottom is that it's a race you just might win. And comparing A and B, comparing Paddy and Johnny, it's easy. It leads to fast answers. But it's addictive, and it's addictive because it's busy, and it's creating that illusion of value, and that the people creating the information are valuable. You see, you've got this signal and noise thing, and you've got to understand signal and noise. The more you look at data without a well-adjusted filter through having the right questions, the higher the noise-to-signal ratio is. Wisdom's reached by getting clarity, finding the signal in the noise. But focusing on the noise, it gives us the right answers to the wrong questions. How can we get fitter, faster, stronger? Instead of, you know, as I said before, how can we drive, at the same time, performance, participation, and personal development and wellness? And great, con great questions in the GAA context are ones grounded in human interest. Make no mistake. Human interest allied with, and as a platform to performance, it gets a signal. It ensures that we're leveraging sports science in a balanced and nuanced way. And sports science done well, and in a responsible, appropriate, and balanced fashion, can, it can be a force for good. It absolutely can. It can facilitate insights. It can facilitate interdependence. And it can help integration. It's about having the right support tool to shine a light on the right answers to the right questions. There's a continuum involved here. It's the why, what, how stuff. <laughs> and again, great, great questions in the GEA context. So the ones grounded in human interest with a focus on values and behaviours, those values and behaviours that we want to espouse, allied with the legacy that we want to create and promote. So, the answers for me are in front of your nose. Some of you may have done this before. If you have, just sit back for 70 seconds, enjoy it again. If you haven't done it, just you can follow the on-screen instructions. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. Close. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! You know, it's funny, it's a nice little neat exercise. It helps me stop talking for a few seconds. But the answers are at the end of our noses if we want to see this done well. See, sports science done well, it's used by leaders instead of managers. It's people who understand that values drive behaviours. But leaders need followers. Those who follow and assume and personify these values, they then drive a culture. In these environments, sports science is a balanced intervention. It's driven solely by the, people of the, need, the needs of the people in the room. It gives you offer insights into many questions, but really, really good questions like, what are we doing? How are we doing it? And why are we doing it? It's got to be a human capital investment, as opposed to just something that's cool to do and keeping up with the Joneses. Otherwise, and I've seen this a lot of times, trust me, 
in many countries, many, many sports, it's not going to be a profitable investment of time, money, energy, emotion, and it's not an investment in the future. So when it's done well, and it's well managed, what does it help us to become? When it's introduced properly, and it, you know, it helps us navigate the complexity of human beings and begin to understand what's best for them, individually and collectively. And it gives us insights. Insights are simple, guys. It's meaningful, actionable, outcome-focused prompts. A nudge. It's to help what's in here. It's not to supersede it. Absolutely not. So, just to finish off, what I'm saying is that balance is vital. Sports science won't, or no, probably should go away. But equally well, you shouldn't have it imposed on you or just buy in cheaply with an eye to a quick fix or just being results driven. The tail should not wag the dog. So balance is vital. And great formative questions grounded in values, philosophies, and a people-centered culture will ensure that. Now, it's a challenge. There's no doubt. There's a lot of marketing and sales patter out there to tell you what you aren't, how you're missing out, what your competition are doing, what you need to do to keep up with the Joneses. But look, the best way to achieve balance, just go back to your heart and intuition. The first real positive um, male in my, in my life is a, is, a, is a teacher called Mr. Pigman. And, and I thought that this teacher, Mr. Pigman, the words I got from the people was that he died. And uh, I was, I was, you know what I mean? At the time I was like, oh, he was gutted. Because he, he was somebody who would sit me down, he would talk to me, when, you know, when I had my, he used to call it the heebie-jeebies because I would get angry from being like this to full on rage. And he would sit me down and he would talk to me and he explained to me, you know what I mean, how to communicate. Um, so then he took me out of the class. He literally taught me to read and write properly himself. He taught me how to sit down and read a book, sit down how to, to write. And then once he realised I could play football and everything, he started to teach me how to, to, to play football and how you have to pass to, your, to, to other people and why you have to pass to other people and why you have to communicate nicely and why you have to give people encouragement. And um, so, just like I say, when I met him in this situation, I'm at Highbury, you know what I mean? I'm doing this thing, it's all emotional stuff, and all of a sudden, the teacher that I thought was dead comes from behind me. Hello, you. Long time no see. Mr. Pigman. <laughs> You're alive. I'm alive, he says. How are you doing? As you see, I'm very touching, and I'm so glad you've done so well with yourself. And I literally started to cry like I was like, I don't know, a five, six-year-old, uncontrollable crying, proper, like coming out my nose, spit in my mouth and everything, because of um, how happy I was to see him. And, you know, it's, it's, when I watched it, that is when I, I, I realised how much of an effect that that man had on my life and how much and how important it is to have a positive, um, positive male figure in your life. And uh, I didn't even realise how much of a positive role model he was on me until I got older and at that, that particular moment, really. <clears throat> I, I'm pretty sure Ian didn't cry for a sports scientist. But um, sports science, and it's, it's, it's not to beat up, as I said, I'm not here to talk it up or talk it down. But it does work best when it's used to answer the right questions. And it works really, really well when it's there to drive the best connections. So it's connection to what our people truly need to develop their personal and playing potential. So it's connection with performance, connection with participation, and connection with personal development and wellness. And how do we get there? Well, unlike the drunk guy at the lamppost, you gotta leverage sports science not only for support, but for illumination. Folks, if you're going to get involved in it, tread carefully, take your time, don't be sold to and, you know, don't go down the road of reading all the brochures and that kind of stuff. Decide to use, use it to open doors for people, not to close them. And like Mr. Pigden there, focus on the person. Keep them at the heart of the matter and let 
that then guide you to deciding what the right balance is and how to keep the balance right. So thanks for your time. If you have any questions, we might have, I don't know, a minute or two before you can go up and listen to him and then so. But thanks very much for your attention. Appreciate it.